Professor Galinsky earned her PhD at the University of Leeds and was appointed to the UNH faculty in 1990. His record of scholarship over the past two decades is truly impressive. He is considered a leading international scholar in the history of science. Indeed, he has recently returned from the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia, where he served as the Gordon Cain Distinguished Fellow. Just one of several fellowship awards he's received over the years on both sides of the Atlantic that speak to his scholarly reputation. In addition to having published scores of journal articles, book chapters, and reviews, <coughs> Professor Galinsky has authored three books, Science as Public Culture, Making Natural Knowledge, and his award-winning book, the, uh, British Weather and the Climate of Enlightenment. <coughs> he has also co-edited uh, co a fourth book, the Sciences in Enlightened Europe, and is now working on his fifth book, the subject of his talk today, which examines the career of Humphrey Davy, the 19th century British chemist and inventor. <coughs> and as some of you may know, Davy is the inventor of the Davy lamp, uh, which is a safety lamp used in coal mines, still used in coal mines, <coughs> um, in some instances. Professor Galinsky's teaching is equally impressive. One colleague said that Professor Galinsky seems an expert on all subjects of intellectual and cultural history. This broad command is part of what makes him an engaging and effective teacher, equally adept in a humanities introductory uh, course and a specialized PhD seminar. <coughs> Students consistently <coughs> recognize and praise this expert knowledge as well as his engaging teaching style and his great sense of humor, even as he is rigorous in his expectations. I, too, can personally attest to his expertise and broad command of subject matter. He's one of the few intellects I know whom I refer to as encyclopedic. <laughs> I can remember several instances when I have engaged Yuan in conversation on a topic I thought I knew a fair amount of it only to end up listening to a, a mini-lecture and learning a great deal more than I had ever expected to have become. What is so immediately apparent in such occasions is the breadth and depth of Young's knowledge. For his outstanding work as both a scholar and teacher, Professor, <coughs> Professor Galinsky has been recognized with the Lindbergh Award, the highest award in the college. Congratulations to Professor Galinsky on this prestigious award. Galinsky's lecture today is entitled Romantic Science, Humphrey Davies, Consolations and Travel. And again, please join me in welcoming Professor Jan Galinsky. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. This is a remarkable turnout. I hope it will be worth your while and sacrificing your lunch for this. Um, and I really have to thank the members of the Lindbergh Prize Committee um, who uh, awarded me this honor. It really is uh, enormously appreciated, uh, this uh, recognition from my colleagues and students here at UNH. Um, so what I'm going to present today is uh, drawn from my uh, current work on uh, Humphrey Davy. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, uh, Dean Fuld uh, uh, knew about Davy's safety lamp, which is actually in this picture, though it's very hard to see on the side there. Um, what I'm trying to do is not really a biography of Davy, but it's a study of the way in which how he became the person he became. Um, it's an attempt to deepen our understanding of what it meant at this time and place for somebody to become a practitioner of the sciences. And I'm approaching the issue not just as a matter of building institutions and careers, but as a more profound process of creating an identity or a mode of selfhood. Uh, and for that reason, I'm calling the book The Experimental Self. So here we are. This is uh, another version of the same portrait by Thomas Phillips from 1821. Um, at the end of March 1828, Sir Humphrey Davy, the most famous chemist of his day, left England never to return. He was seeking to recover his health by traveling on the European continent where he hoped the climate would be more congenial and the distractions of society less demanding. 
The previous year, a debilitating stroke had caused him to resign as president of the Royal Society and to curtail his social activities in London. His great scientific discoveries, including sodium, potassium, and other elements produced by analysis using an electrical battery, and his inventions, such as the miner's safety lamp, were all behind him. At the age of 49, it seemed that his brilliant career was now over. In the following months, his travels took him to the Austrian provinces of Styria and Carniola and to Italy, where he settled for the winter season in Rome. There, he experienced a further devastating stroke in February 1829. Fearing that his death was imminent, he summoned his wife, Jane, from London and his brother, John, who was then serving as a surgeon with the British Army in Malta. After they joined him in Rome, he began the slow journey home, but only reached as far as Geneva, where he died on the 29th of May, 1829. Two days later, his mortal remains were buried in a cemetery just outside the Swiss city. And the following year, his last book was published. Consolations in Travel, or The Last Days of a Philosopher, was edited by Davy's brother, from a manuscript completed by the author shortly before his death. Readers who eagerly seized upon this posthumous work of a distinguished man of science found themselves puzzled by the diversity of its contents and confounded by its peculiar form. The six chapters are mostly in the form of dialogues, in which a group of fictional characters with elaborate Greek names discuss chemistry, geology, and other sciences. But the first chapter immediately establishes that this is not a typical scientific text. This is the opening of the first chapter. In it, the narrator, called Philalethes, recounts a vision he's experienced in the Colosseum in Rome. Resting there in the moonlight, he's visited by a mysterious voice, which announces itself as a superior intelligence from another world. The spirit, or genius, then unveils to the narrator scenes of previous eras in the world's history and of life on other planets. In the next chapter, the narrator and his companions discuss the meaning of this vision while contemplating the view from the summit of Mount Vesuvius. Each of the subsequent chapters is set in a different exotic locale. The third at the Temple of Pestum in Campania, the fourth and fifth in the Austrian Alps, including the cavern at Adelsburg, which is now Postoina in Slovenia, and the sixth in the harbour at Pula, which is now Pula in Croatia. The conversations range across the history of life on Earth and the prospects for the future of humanity, touching also on questions of religious doctrine, such as the persistence of life after death. The, the dialogues wander among these metaphysical issues alongside more recognisably scientific topics, with frequent digressions and sometimes abrupt transitions of subject matter. As he was finishing the book, Davy wrote to his wife that Consolations, which is what I'm going to call it for short, was a piece of, quote, philosophical poetry, though not in metre. This paradoxical description was reflected in the puzzlement of the reviewers, most of whom found the whole thing rather indigestible. <laughs> A critic in the Athenaeum, one of the leading literary journals of the day, remarked on Davies, quote, very ingenious, if somewhat visionary, hypotheses and speculations. A writer in the Dublin Literary Gazette declared that some of the contents were, quote, extravagant and almost bordering on the absurd. A critic of the Monthly Review noted the fantastic design of the work, and he didn't mean that as a compliment. <laughs> Some of the obituary notices for Davy ignored the book altogether, reflecting the sense that it was an anomaly among his publications and a bit of an embarrassment. What commentary there was mostly restricted itself to summarizing the heterogeneous contents and quoting extracts from the text. But whatever its peculiarities, the book proved popular, and that popularity was sustained for the remainder of the 19th century. There were at least nine individual editions published in London before 1900, and two more in which Constellations was combined with other works by Davy. Uh, it's the fifth edition uh, from which these illustrations are taken. They were, not, they were not present in the first edition. 
There was an American edition in Philadelphia uh, very soon after the first London one, and another one appeared in Boston 40 years later. There was a German translation and a Dutch one very soon after the first publication, and other languages followed. It might indeed have been a literary monster, but there's no doubt that it drew significant numbers of readers and continued to draw them in subsequent decades. Academic criticism of the work has tended to follow in the tracks of the early reviewers. Most scholars have agreed that Consolation saw Davy indulging the poetic imagination he'd expressed in his youth when he associated with the poets Coleridge, Wordsworth and Southey. Though the volume in fact contains none of Davy's poetry and is written entirely in prose. It's also been identified as a philosophical work reflecting the author's knowledge of the classical philosophical tradition and his second-hand acquaintance with contemporary trends in German philosophy. The literary scholar Richard Holmes has called it one of the most extraordinary prose books of the late Romantic period. These characterizations are fine as far as they go, but they leave many questions unanswered about the book's specific themes and form. One can situate it in relation to literary and philosophical traditions and within the prevailing climate of Romanticism, but that does not explain why contemporaries found it both appealing and puzzling. I'm going to argue for a closer attention to specific features of the text and the context in which it was both produced and read. Some of its features were shared with other works of the era, but I don't think they can be explained by reference to the broader movement of Romanticism. Rather, I'll suggest that the text needs to be read in conjunction with partic the particular circumstances of Davy's life and career and the specific approach to studying the natural world that he fostered. There are two particular aspects of the book that I want to focus on. First, there's the relationship between the book and its author. Because of the circumstances of its publication, the text was immediately and inseparably associated with the recently deceased writer. But within the book, at least two different characters are used to stand in for Davy, a technique that distances the author from his fictional personae. This was a source of confusion for many of his readers, but I believe it can be understood in relation to Davy's lifelong project of experimenting with his own identity. Second, Constellations represents a particular kind of aesthetic approach to the natural world. It shows how an appreciation of landscape can open out into an understanding of its history. This also was an innovative feature of the text and ambiguous in its implications. Davy identified the contemplation of the lengthy history of the earth with the aesthetic experience of the sublime. Such an experience was appealing to many readers even to those who disagreed with him quite profoundly as to what it implied for questions of religious doctrine. So, first, the relation of the book to the author. We know from Davy's last letters to his wife and his brother that he saw the book as his most precious legacy. He began the composition in June 1828 at Ischl in the Austrian Alps, where part of the dialogue is set. John James Tobin, who was accompanying him on his journey as a companion and amanuensis, recorded at the time that Davy was dictating what he called his vision for an hour or two each morning. A couple of months later, Davy wrote to his wife Jane that he felt like a mother ushering a beloved child into the world. It's an intriguing simile, given that their marriage was childless and neither of them had natural offspring. At the beginning of December, he wrote again to Jane, it may be imagination, but I seem to see the novel scheme of the universe more clearly than formerly. After his stroke the following February, he was convinced that he had only a few more days to live. At this point, he claimed the privilege of a dying prophet, one whose special insight into matters of life and death derived from his position on the boundary between the two states. He decided at this point on the book's subtitle, The Last Days of a Philosopher, and he charged his brother with the solemn duty of ensuring its publication at all costs. In a letter dictated to his wife a few days after he suffered his second stroke, he wrote, I should not take so much interest in these works did I not believe that they contained truths 
which cannot be recovered if they are lost, and which I am convinced will be extremely useful both to the moral and intellectual world. I may be mistaken in this point, yet it is the conviction of a man perfectly sane in all his intellectual faculties and looking into futurity with the prophetic aspirations belonging to the last moments of existence. For anyone who picked up the book after publication, it was impossible to detach it from its author's circumstances at the end of his life. Davy initially planned to be identified on the title page as, quote, the author of Salmonia. That was his, his book, previous book about salmon fishing. This was not a serious attempt at anonymity, since it was widely known who that author was, but it would have kept the work at a slight distance from his more mainstream scientific publications. In the event, however, when Constellations appeared, Davy's name was prominently displayed below the title, as you can see here, not only Humphrey Davy, but Sir Humphrey Davy, but late, late president of the Royal Society. Also, the very first thing that readers were told in an introductory note contributed by his brother was that the book, quote, was concluded at the very moment of the invasion of the author's last illness. This was followed by a short preface which Davy himself had somehow managed to dictate the day after he suffered his debilitating stroke in Rome. In these ways, the book was presented as inseparable from the individual who had produced it and the circumstances in which he had done so. It owed a large part of its authority to its association with a poet and philosopher on the threshold of his own death, or, as the Dublin Literary Gazette put it, when the soul was quivering on the beam between the two states of existence. <laughs> had Davy survived to see the book published, it is not clear that it would have attracted so much attention or respect. The identification of the book with its author was strengthened by its failure to cite any sources. <coughs> the platonic dialogues were obvious precedents for the philosophical conversations Davy composed, and Georges Cuvier, in fact, was later to call Consolations the last words of a dying Plato. At one stage, Davy intended to call the book The Modern Socrates. The title he finally chose alludes to the Consolation of Philosophy by the 6th century Christian Neoplatonist Boethius. Closer to Davy's own time were the writers of the 18th century Enlightenment, whose influence can be felt from the opening of the first chapter. Uh, at the beginning of the first chapter, the narrator is accompanied by two interlocutors who represent each side of the 18th century dispute over Christianity. On Nufrio, reflects the skepticism about religious doctrine that emerged in the Scottish Enlightenment, while Ambrosio speaks from a moderate position within traditional Catholicism. As they view the scene in the Colosseum, these two, along with Philalethes, recapitulate much of the Enlightenment debate about the legacy of Christianity and classical antiquity. Ambrosio points to the triumph of Christian faith over ancient Roman superstition, and its associated barbarities. For him, the most important lesson to be learned from the ruins of Rome concerns the victory of Christianity over its pagan persecutors. Onufrio, on the other hand, introduces the melancholy reflection that Christian civilization itself is destined to pass away, as that of ancient Rome did in the long sweep of human history. In the background here are such figures as Edward Gibbon, who was inspired to write his account of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by his own meditations in the Forum in Rome. And also the Comte de Volnay, whose uh, ruins of empire achieved great popularity in the 1790s. Uh, this is an image from Volney's Ruins of Empire. Uh, there are several similarities between Volney's work and Davies. Uh, Volney's work also begins in the ruins of an ancient city, uh, in his case, Palmyra, uh, and it also features a ghostly apparition uh, who takes the narrator on a journey into space to view the Earth and its history as a whole. Uh, other writers of the Enlightenment also seem to have inspired Davy's creative imagination. Voltaire's fantasy of extraterrestrial travel, Micromegas, is one likely source for Philalethes' visit to other planets. And the Marquis de Condorcet had long been a favorite author of Davies, 
for his vision of progress as the central theme of human history. It's not hard to spot all these literary influences, which must have been evident to many readers. And yet Davy gave no citations and mentioned no names of his literary precursors. The impression he wanted to give was that the book had originated entirely in his own imagination. Its central theme, the history of the earth and human progress, was conveyed through the fictional devices of dreams and visions. Readers naturally wanted to know whose experiences these were, and they tended to assume that individual was the author. This presumably was why John Davy made sure his brother's identity was firmly stamped on the book from the beginning. And yet the book flouted the normal conventions of written dialogues or conversations in which the author was identified with one particular position. Davy didn't appear in his own person, and he seemed to have more than one representative among the fictional participants. This led to difficulties for readers who wanted to work out what he actually believed and wanted to communicate. John Davy addressed the puzzlement felt by many readers of the book when he wrote his brother's biography in the late 1830s. He claimed that the Colosseum vision was based on a dream Humphrey Davy had had in Rome in 1819. Another incident mentioned in the text was dated to earlier in Davy's life, to 1807, when he'd experienced a vivid and apparently prophetic dream during a bout of serious illness. On the other hand, John explained that his brother had never fallen down a waterfall or traveled to Palestine, although these things happened to characters in the book. The confusion was understandable given how much the characters did share the experiences of their author. The initial vision in the Colosseum is assigned to Philalethes, though a few pages later he admits it was a composite of dreams he had had on various occasions. The effect here is the rather dizzying one of the author dropping his character's mask or jumping the frame of the narrative. Although still speaking in the voice of Philalethes, Davy seems to be peeping out from behind him to say, yes, I gave my character a fictional vision, but it was based on dreams I have really had. The conversation moves on to a dream of special significance, the one Davy had while suffering a severe bout of typhus fever in 1807. Philalethes tells the story of how in his delirious state at that time, he saw a vision of a beautiful woman then unknown to him. Ten years later, he was reminded of the, of the vision when he encountered the attractive young daughter of an innkeeper in Illyria. Now, says Philalethes, comes the extraordinary part of the narrative. Ten years after, 20 years after my first illness, at a time when I was exceedingly weak from a severe and dangerous malady, I again met the person who was the representative of my visionary female. And to her kindness and care, I believe I owe what remains to me of existence." End quote. So it may be Philalethes who's speaking in the text, but the dream was Davy's own, as was the insistence that it had truly been prophetic. The young woman, who was his muse and later his nurse, really existed. Her name was Josephine Detela. She lived in the city of Laibach, which is now Ljubljana in Slovenia, and Davy left her money in his will. So throughout this part of the text, there's a strange oscillation between author and character, a motion of masking and unmasking on Davy's behalf. He assigned this particular dream to his character, Philalethes, and yet, to guarantee its validity as a prophecy, he had to drop the mask and repossess the dream for himself, insisting that it was no fiction, but a real event. The confusions are compounded by the introduction of a new character in the third dialogue. Visiting the temple of Pestum in southern Italy, Philalethes and his companions meet a mysterious stranger called simply the Unknown. He's found sitting in the ancient ruins, making notes in a memorandum book. He's said to present a remarkable appearance with a handsome countenance and a dress described as very peculiar, almost like that of an ecclesiastic. As the unknown begins to give his opinions about the possible virtues of chlorine as a preventive against malaria, about the geology of the region, and eventually about the evolution of the planet and living things, Readers seem again to hear Davy's own voice. 
In the fourth dialogue, the unknown is encountered once more in the Austrian Alps, where he rescues Philalethes from nearly drowning in a boating accident. The near fatal experience is followed by a discussion on personal immortality and whether life continues after <coughs> death. In the next dialogue, the unknown assumes the role of the chemical philosopher, voicing what is clearly Davy's own claim to that title. The character explains that advances in the technical fields of chemistry depend upon the elevated intellectual perspective of the philosopher. Such a perspective requires an individual to be noble in spirit and outlook, not seeking personal gain or profit. Only by being independent of material needs can one engage in the sublime speculations that encompass universal truth while also serving earthly needs. The unknown was clearly intended by Davy to personify this unworldly figure, who by virtue of his abstraction from mundane desires could attain true wisdom and realize the true utility of science. Readers were nonetheless puzzled by Davy's having introduced another character to represent himself when Philalethes already seemed to be playing that role. Accustomed to the conventions whereby an author spoke unequivocally through one character, they were confused by Davy's adoption of more than one persona. The Monthly Review thought that the unknown was a more authentic mask for Davy to assume, notwithstanding, quote, that the author appears to have disposed of his own identity already in the character of Philalethes. John Davy suggested that his brother took several roles in the book because he was himself a man of many parts, poet, metaphysician, geologist, chemist, and Christian. Underlying all of these was the figure of the philosopher in the original modest and humble meaning of the word. The unknown was therefore, according to John Davy, the most fundamental of Davy's identities. John recorded that he discussed this matter with his brother and it evidently encountered some resistance to the suggestion that the unknown was another self-portrait. He ventured nonetheless to contradict his brother and insisted that the identification was correct. John wrote, independent of his dress and some of the incidents of his life, he was essentially the prototype in sentiments, feelings, opinions, doctrines, in brief, in mind. The religious sentiments the unknown expresses and his metaphysical doctrines were, I believe, entirely my brother's own." End quote. Now this matter of religious sentiments posed a further conundrum for Davies' readers. He was publicly identified as a member of the Church of England, and yet consolation seemed unexpectedly pro-Catholic in its sympathies. Ambrosio, who upheld the side of religious orthodoxy in the jousts with Onufrio, was explicitly identified as a Catholic, and was widely assumed to be based on a papal nuncio, Monsignor Spada, who had befriended Davy in Italy. When the unknown comes on the scene, there's a curious incident in which Ambrosio identifies him also as a Catholic, since he's wearing a rosary. The unknown explains that he's actually an Anglican, but that he wears the rosary in tribute to Pius VII, whom he met in exile at Fontainebleau. Again, readers assumed that the episode had happened to Davy himself. The reviewer in the Athenaeum wrote that the anecdote was, quote, so pleasing that we would be sorry to think it is not a literal account of a real occurrence. And it has more value also in our eyes when we persuade ourselves that we may consider the narrator of the story as Sir Humphrey Davy himself, end quote. It was again left to John Davy to try to sort the matter out in his biography. He noted that the story has the unknown receiving the rosary at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, but Na Davy never actually visited the Holy Land. He was in Rome in 1814 when Pius VII returned to the city from captivity under Napoleon, but there's no evidence that he actually met the pontiff. It seems that Davy did have a degree of respect for Catholicism and for at least some of its devotees, but readers who thought he was endorsing Catholic doctrine were misled by the slippage between the author and his characters. Given the constant masking and unmasking in which Davy indulged in consolations, the confusion is understandable. Why then did Davy adopt this stylistic device? Why did he introduce more than one figure to represent different aspects of himself? 
One answer is that it was consistent with a lifelong tendency to adopt masks of one kind or another, to experiment with his own identity. Davy was constantly assuming new personae in his public performances as a scientific lecturer, in the course of his rapid rise up the social ladder, and in his writings. Consolations could be seen as his last virtuoso performance, his last experiment with his own identity. He also seems to have believed that a fictional character not too closely identified with himself possessed the kind of charismatic authority needed to convey his message. In one of his notebooks in 1827, he'd made some jottings intended to introduce some kind of autobiography. It would, he remarked, focus not on himself, but, quote, on a very extraordinary person, a mind far superior to my own. Of this individual, he wrote, his opinions are wont to be so singular, his lessons so instructive, and his history so mysterious that they are worthy of being recorded, end quote. By the end of these notes, Davy had dubbed this individual the unknown. He had discovered the character who was later to assume such a prominent role in Constellations. Davy noted that the character would seem forever youthful, like one who had discovered the elixir of the alchemists or the secret of eternal life. With these attributes, he would compel readers to attend to the message he had to impart. So the unknown was conceived as an un unworldly, even otherworldly being, not so much a flesh and blood person as a spirit or angel temporarily assuming human form. This allowed the character to speak with authority on a pivotal theme of the book, the prospect of intellectual or spiritual life continuing beyond the death of the material body. This was of urgent concern for a man confronting his own mortality, as Davy was at this time. He sought comfort in the view that mind and body were not inseparably connected to one another, that the former could survive independently of the latter. He repeatedly reassured others and himself that his ailments were affecting only his body, that his mental capacities remained unimpaired. The play with multiple masks and roles was a way to reinforce the point that the intellect or spirit is not to be identified with an individual's physical manifestation. Bodily features change in the course of someone's life, but intellectual identity remains. This is what gives grounds for the hope that it may continue in some form after death. The point is made in a rather unexpected way in the fourth dialogue, entitled The Proteus, or Immortality. After Philethes is rescued from nearly drowning after his fall down a cataract, he and a companion called Eubathes go with the unknown into the cavern at Adelsburg. Philethes is musing on his near encounter with death, but the immediate object of the journey is to study the amphibian, Proteus anguinus, which dwells in the cave. These organisms had drawn Davy's attention in the last months of his life, and the conversation touches on the peculiar features revealed by his inquiry. The creatures are able to live below or above water because they possess both gills and lungs. Their origins are obscure, as are their feeding habits and mode of reproduction. The discussion then passes to the chemistry of respiration, and to whether the air could be the source of a material principle that constitutes vitality. The unknown is adamant that the mystery of life cannot be explained in this materialistic manner. Quote, I can never believe that intelligence can result from combinations of insensate or brute atoms. Mental processes cannot be identified with the material organs of the senses. On the contrary, the mind is an immaterial entity that exists continuously throughout the changes in a person's body during their lifetime. And at the end, as the unknown puts it, quote, the mind, as it were, falls asleep to awake to a new existence. Although Eubathes resists this conclusion, Philolethes professes himself satisfied with the unknown's deduction. Speaking again for Davy himself, Philolethes denounces materialism as, quote, a cold, heavy, dull, and insupportable doctrine necessarily tending to atheism. He neglects to say 
that he had in fact flirted with it in his youth when Davy associated with the materialist position, Thomas Beddoes and other radical thinkers. The flirtation was short-lived and Davy was soon vigorously crossing out the materialistic comments in his own old notebooks. By the 1820s, he'd openly allied himself with the anti-materialist side of a bitterly fought controversy that was dividing the scientific and especially the medical community. The reviewers had no difficulty discerning which side Davy was taking in this dispute. The Monthly Review welcomed his attack on the sophisms and materialist physiologists. The British Magazine expressed its appreciation for his support of the Orthodox Christian doctrine. And the anti-infidel magazine, not surprisingly, <laughs> hailed his demolition of a theory, quote, which some half-informed vendors of blasphemy are so anxious to diffuse. On this issue, it seems, Davy had managed to speak without equivocation, having aligned the positions of both of his spokesmen on the anti-materialist side of the debate. This is not, however, the final note struck in Consolations. Nor does Christian orthodoxy quite have the last word. The final dialogue, Pola, or Time, has the characters discussing long-term changes in the material world. They consider the operations of gravity, heat, and chemical forces, the wearing down of mountains by erosion, and the destruction of human monuments by corruption and decay. Faced with the melancholy prospect of the mutability of all things, Philolethes and the unknown agree that comfort must be sought from faith in God's design. Christianity provides the reassurance that all these transformations are ultimately serving the divine plan. The theme is one that Davy might have taken from his classical precursor, Boethius, in Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. Human anxieties and uncertainties are allayed by an awareness of the providential design underpinning the cosmos. Everything must ultimately be for the best, since providence rules over the universe as a whole. But the very final sentence of Davy's book offers a rather more materialistic solace, one that seems closer to the Roman atheist poet Lucretius than to Boethius. Speaking at the end, Philolethes suggests that even if human monuments decay to dust, they can sustain the growth of vegetation to nourish new life. Quote, nature asserts her empire over the ruins, and the vegetable world rises in constant youth, and in a period of annual successions, by the labors of man, providing food, vitality, and beauty upon the wrecks of monuments which were once raised for purposes of glory, but which are now applied to objects of utility. In the end, then, the consolations Davy was offering in this book go beyond those of traditional Christianity. The reassurance of traditional faith was ultimately not quite sufficient. Also needed was a sense of cosmic change over very long periods of time, the cyclical succession of destruction and restoration, death and rebirth. It was this latter kind of consolation that Davy derived from his travels and which he identified with a sense of the sublime. Repeatedly in the book, he opened his reader's eyes to how the landscape around them had been shaped by the prolonged operation of natural forces. He drew upon the writings of contemporary geologists and his own observations in the field to describe the effects of volcanoes and earthquakes, sedimentation and erosion. He invoked rivers carving valleys out of rocks while new mountains were thrust up from beneath the earth. And he extended this sense of deep time into the cosmos at large, mentioning on the last pages of the book William Herschel's idea that stars and planets could be formed from the nebulae glimpsed through telescopes. He even suggested that such planetary systems could be inhabited by, quote, genii, or seraphic intelligences, presumably akin to the spirit who had spoken to the meditating Philolethes in the Colosseum. This was the philosophical vision of the cosmos into which Davy sought to escape from his earthly troubles. It's not surprising that readers such as his brother worried that it was not exactly compatible with Christian orthodoxy. Davy was not seeking scriptural salvation, 
and he was not awaiting bodily resurrection. Rather, he was hoping that his spirit might flee from the trammels of his afflicted body into what J.J. Tobin called the oft self-imagined planetary world. The uncertainties and ambivalences of constellations contributed to its long-standing popularity, as the 19th century remained preoccupied with the questions of science and faith it had raised. Charles Lyell made several comments on the book in his Principles of Geology, the first volume of which was published in the same year, 1830. Lyell was particularly impressed by Davy's ability to discern the effects of long-acting natural forces in shaping the landscape. He quoted Davy's description of the deposition of travertine marble by sedimentation in springs and lakes in Campania. On the other hand, Lyell resisted Davy's supposition that evolution manifested a progression in forms of life. At this point in his career, Lyell regarded such theories as unproven and speculative. He rather condescendingly referred to Davy as, quote, a philosopher pleased to indulge in conjectures on this subject. <laughs> a few years later, Charles Darwin tackled constellations, just as he was beginning to formulate his own ideas about evolution. He noted a simile in which Davy had compared philosopher's ignorance of the causes of life to that of a so-called savage contemplating a steam engine. In a telling remark, Darwin recorded that such a person might be more impressed by a piece of colored glass than by a steam engine. The comment seems to reflect not only Darwin's actual experience of the people he called savages in the course of his voyage of the Beagle, but also his increasing sympathy for materialism. His point was that imputations of design are relative to human capacities. If we don't have the relevant experience, we cannot even recognize the steam engine as something that was designed. The implication is that we should hesitate before identifying divine design in the universe at large or in individual creatures. The responses of Lyell and Darwin testify to the openness of Davy's constellations, its availability for interpretation by readers who did not share its author's outlook. The dialogical form had something to do with this and Davy's use of multiple characters to express his own views made the text more than usually ambiguous. One reason for the book's popularity was precisely that the author could not control the meanings his readers drew out of it. Lyle disputed the notion of the progressive evolution of living things, but he valued Davy's insight into the long-term effects of continuous forces in geology. Darwin read the book, and tested his own emerging materialism against Davy's opposing perspective. Both men were captivated and inspired by consolations, notwithstanding their differences with its author. The way Davy invested travel with deep philosophical significance resonated with other scientific travelers too. Davy had shown them how one could draw from an experience of landscape a profound sense of the history of the earth. And for those inclined to read the book this way, he had suggested that this kind of cosmic vision could provide a complement or alternative to traditional Christian faith. One can even catch an echo of Davy's closing sentence in the last passage of Darwin's Origin of Species, published nearly 30 years later. In that famous passage, Darwin evokes a similar sense of change and eternal renewal with quote, the planet cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity while evolution slowly takes its course. I've tried to suggest how we can recapture some of this sense of Davy's constellations as an inspirational work. Blandly categorizing the book as an example of romanticism does not seem to me to reveal quite why it was so influential and yet so ambiguous. So widely read, and yet so generally regarded as an enigma. I've been arguing that these qualities reflected the relationship of the book to its author, both the circumstances in which it was composed during Davy's last illness, and the way it distributes his experiences and opinions among the characters in the text itself. In one respect, as its readers knew, this is a deeply personal book, mirroring Davy's most intimate hopes and trepidations as he approached his own demise. <coughs> 
As the early reviews admitted, the book probably would not have gained so much attention had it not been promoted as the last words of a great man of science. Consolations was presented to be read in just that way, with the appropriate title page, prefatory notice, and accompanying publicity. But when readers picked it up, they found it less straightforward than they expected to disentangle Davies' message. They were confused by the dialectical back and forth of the argument and by the attribution of Davies' characteristics and ideas to more than one participant in the dialogues. They wanted to know which of the events depicted had really happened to him and which of the points of view was really his. But by allowing uncertainty to remain about these matters, Davy had, in a sense, opened his work to a greater range of interpretations than it might otherwise have gathered. As it turned out, that was to secure the book a readership well beyond the lifetimes of those who remembered Davy or even knew who he was. In this paradoxical way, Davy's ambitions for the book were fulfilled, at least for several decades. Writing to his brother and his wife in the days after he suffered his catastrophic stroke in Rome, Davy said that he expected his bones to rest in the eternal city. That was not to be. He also declared that consolations in travel would be his spiritual legacy to live on long after he was gone. Until the end of the 19th century, that prophecy came true. As far as I can tell, however, no new edition of the book has appeared since the beginning of the 20th century, though you can now get it from Google Books and as print on demand. So perhaps it's time for it to be read again. did them, um, they, they appear in the fifth edition, which is from 1851, so that's 20 years after the first edition. Um, and uh, yeah, there isn't much more I can say about them, I'm afraid. I don't know where they came from. Uh, uh, John Murray was the publisher. He retained um, uh, you know, the copyright for several decades thereafter, so this is again a Murray edition. But where he got the illustrations from, I'm afraid I don't know. His John Davy continued to um, be interested in the progress of the uh, subsequent editions, uh, and he was still alive at the time when this appeared, so he may have had some say over the matter, but I haven't found any, any documentation. But in this way, his control over, did have control of the illustrations, would it have tried to include them so that his brother didn't sound so um, controversial? <laughs> Um, John, he, he was, I don't know whether one could read the illustrations in that way, but John Davy definitely was, I mean, he was a very vigilant protector of his brother's reputation, as was frequently the case with widows and uh, uh, other surviving family members in the era. Um, uh, and he, I mean, one of the things he insisted on was that there was no, uh, there was nothing here that was in any way deviant from, from uh, Orthodox Christian doctrine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Bill? Um, you suggested that, that part of the reason for its continued success was that it was the, sort of the last words of a, of a great scientist. But it seems to me that that might, in fact, only care, you know, have um, much weight for the first couple of editions. After that, it would be, you know, 20 years afterwards, it's, it's not like you're rushing to, you know, catch these uh, last words. I w wonder if there's another explanation for why it lasted quite as long. Uh, as it did. Yeah, you're probably right. I mean, uh, as, I, as I also said, I mean, it, did, it continued to be read after, you know, living memory of Davy had, had gone. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't have anything to offer in the way of an answer to that, but it could have been because people knew, uh, you know, how other people had read it. Um, uh, citation by people like Lyle. Uh, and uh, because of continuing interest in the, the issues of 
science and religion, uh, which would, would make it of continuing interest, I would think. But you're right, I, it would be nice to be able to offer something more specific by way of a decade by decade history of its reception. Yeah. Um, this is what a, a wonderful eclectic mix of philosophy and mysticism and religion and, and some science and evolution. Before this publication, was there any indication from Baby that he had this in him, or was this a complete departure? Yeah, um, uh, uh, one way one can understand this is as a reversion to uh, some of his uh, preoccupations from earlier in his life, when he actually published one or two poems. Uh, he continued to write poetry, though he, he didn't publish any poetry after um, uh, around 1800, I think. But, um, uh, I mean, that was, as I say, uh, lots of reviewers uh, seized on that, and they said this is, you know, Davy uh, reverting to his poetic sort of self. Um, so I think that was, that was fairly widely known. I mean, the, the, uh, the, another episode, which I could talk about at length but won't, uh, from early in his life was the uh, nitrous oxide, the famous nitrous oxide uh, experiments, where uh, Davy published an account of his own and others' respirations of nitrous oxide in Bristol in the end of the 1790s, in which, um, you know, the mind-altering properties of the gas were, were experienced. And so, and this was also widely known, and that shaped, my book will argue, that shaped Davy's public reputation from that point on. So, the idea that Davy had this sort of poetic, uh, you could say mystical, um, sort of in inspired, a, a capacity to be inspired, uh, by the sublime forces of nature, that was that was fairly widely known. Yeah. Uh, so to pick up what Bill asked, I noticed that it was published by Murray, and published a lot of travel books. So maybe it helped that it was part of a list of travel books. Maybe that helped keep an interest going on. Yeah, Just it's a good it's a good thought. Um, uh, Murray published other works of Davies. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean that, that is. Hence the illustrations. Yeah. 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 Yes, uh, and uh, my question sort of connects with that. It does seem to be very much in the tradition of the ground tour, uh, but a sort of ground tour that's a mixture of uh, sort of natural philosophy as well as uh, sort of cultural deepening, one that happens at the end of his education rather than at the beginning of, of, of the education. And I'm just wondering how much uh, things like his observations about the weathering of the mountains was general knowledge at this, peri of, at this period and how much of that was sort of uh, novel. Because just from catching a little glimpse of text that you got up, up there, what seemed to me really interesting is speculation on the origins of the misery things and the mountains. And, and, and to what degree was the science itself something that people found fascinating? Um, I think I think it was found to be fascinating. Um, uh, I mean, Davy wasn't the only person thinking about evolution at this time, and obviously you understand that he thinks about it in an entirely theistic yes. manner. Um, uh, and he wouldn't certainly would not have been the only person thinking about it in those terms. Um, so, and, and also, um, uh, I mean, Lyle uh, was famously, you know, going to uh, uh, popularize the idea of landscape as, as the product of a long process of historical change. Um, so there are also other people writing about that kind of thing. So I don't think, I don't think there was, in, in terms of the actual scientific content, it, it's hard to see, point to anything that's really very specific. Um, it's sort of little things like, um, you know, uh, observing the way in which uh, marble deposits accumulate in these lakes in, in Campania, or the specific studies of that amphibian, which Davy was, he was very keen on that, and he published a paper in the Philosophical Transactions about that. But, um, you know, so the, the very specific scientific findings were fairly limited. Um, but it was, read, it was read more for the expansiveness of the vision uh, and the way in which that was synthesized within 
you know, uh, uh, something that's about, you know, not just of cosmic significance but of personal uh, uh, significance also. Um, there were several prophets wandering around North America around this time. I mean, the most famous, of course, uh, John Smith of Book of Mormon. And I just sort of wonder whether this took off on the other side of the Atlantic and whether any of those, they're usually more sort of democratic and in these little less intellectual sense. But I wonder whether the sort of high, high tier and low tier are sort of coming together. Um, I don't know quite how to you know, relate it to sort of popular religious movements, because I'm not actually sure, I think there was an Andy who mentioned the word mysticism, and I'm not really sure that's quite right. Uh, I mean, it's, um, you know, Davy, he, in the book, he experiences a vision, he has a voice that speaks to him, but he's not, he's not really recommending a, a sort of mystical exercises or anything like that. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to make any connection with sort of popular religious movements. But, um, uh, I mean, there are, as I mentioned, you know, there are other people, uh, very respectable uh, intellectuals, who are thinking about life on other planets and that sort of thing. I mean, that's, that's, fairly, that's fairly widespread sort of speculation and had been for, for centuries already. Um, so I'm, 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 I'd like to think, find a connection with popular religious movements, but there isn't anything that can occur to me. Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, you said that Davy wasn't strictly a romantic in his ideas of the fugation of nature and the fugation of the mind. So you're suggesting that he wasn't into the whole romantic idea of nature striving for grand perfection, but you also said that he wasn't strictly orthodox in mm -hmm. his ideas of the compatibility of science and religion. So did he ever reach a consensus on that, or was that something that was left out of the book because his brother took out all of these or made sure that nothing was not orthodox? Um, I, I didn't mean to suggest that he was not romantic. I just think that isn't, that isn't the whole story in terms of explaining you know, the specific features of the text and the ways in which, as I say, people found it appealing but also found it puzzling. So I don't think you can quite get down to that level of explanation just by talking about something very general like romanticism. But I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't mean to suggest that he was uh, stood entirely outside that that movement. Um, so what he's advancing is a view of evolution and progress, which, um, uh, as I said, is is understood in a very theistic manner. I mean, this is this is. Uh, evolution as a purposeful process di driven by the laws of nature which are understood as God's laws. So to that degree there's, it's, it's not in principle incompatible with Christian doctrine. The difficulties for doctrine come in, at a more specific level with things like well, how old is the earth then? And what does that imply about scriptural uh, uh, accounts uh, uh, from the book of Genesis? Or, well, what kind of immortality are we talking about uh, where you run into specific issues of, of doctrine? We have time for one more question. And it's yeah, between yeah. Georgian and Sam. You can go, you can go. I'll ask you later. Okay. <laughs> Georgian, yeah. Well, it's. it's Maybe it's a fitting last question. It's a more personal one. What, what attracted you to Davy? Uh, is it, did you recognize a fellow interdisciplinarian? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there is that. Yes, he was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he's a humanities figure, obviously, definitely, and um, uh, yeah, and that was appealing. And it, he, uh, I think. Well, I, I'm always. Um, somebody uh, asked me about this a few years ago, and I realized. The, they'd realise something about myself, me that I'd never realised myself, which I am attracted to hard to interpret texts, things, uh, uh, strange things that have been considered anomalies or peculiar uh, that nobody has quite known what to make of. So that's part of it. Uh, in terms of what the project is on Davy, I mean, it's, he is, yeah, he, he, he represents that as well. I mean, he's an anomaly. He's... Uh, scorned by most of the people who came after him, uh, who uh, 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 form, forged their own ambitions uh, 
as men of science in quite a different way from Davies, uh, and who regarded him as a, as a, um, a dilettante and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, politically uh, uh, far too conservative. Um, so his reputation, you know, is, is, is questionable. Um, so, so, yeah, so he appeals for, that, for those sort of reasons. And, and also because he provides this, these incredibly rich resources for thinking about the question of identity formation in, in a very personal way. That's fascinating. Thank you. Well, your reputation is not... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.